The Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast, with your host, Rich Decker. Hello, and thank you for taking some of your valuable time to listen to the show. My guest for this episode is Chris Ty Melodista. You and me? The possibility we can in this world is one to four hundred trillion. It means our own existence it's a miracle come true. And we're still doubting about ourselves, we're still doubting about our life, and we, we don't take the call. As a lifelong student of martial arts, Chris has always enjoyed challenging himself both physically and mentally by exploring new ways to improve himself and by helping others to do the same. He is a certified life coach from the Hendricks Institute a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming and clinical hypnosis. His practice draws from a vast range of experience in movement, meditation, and breath work, which include yoga, sistema, Russian, martial arts, and MoveNat. In addition, he was the first person in the United States to be Wim Hof certified back in 2014. Now that is an impressive resume. But what leaves a greater impression on you is when you are taking one of his workshops. I had the privilege to participate in a workshop that he and his business partner, Jared, who co-founded Bajaya, Reset, Rebalance, Recover, gave together at Vitality in Chandler, Arizona. It was one of the best workshops I've ever been involved in. This is the hero's journey of Chris Ty Melodista. Bijaya, be victorious. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for joining us on the Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast. I'm really excited to get to know you, who Chris is, and your story and your hero's journey, what brought you to to now. And so the, let's start in the beginning. Tell us about your childhood. Where'd you grow up? And then could you tell us something about a principle that your parents instilled in you for better or worse, sometimes it's not always for the best, that you still carry with you today. Just give us a little uh, background on your upbringing. Uh, hi, Richard. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for hosting me. Wow. So <laughs> I like to start like really like straight, you know. So I'm 43 years old. I was born and raised in Paris in France. My mother, she's uh, half uh, Vietnamese and uh, half French. And uh, my father, who adopted me, is uh, Jewish. I grew up in a mixed family or of culture from uh, the side of my mom, uh, all Asian and Vietnamese culture uh, mixed with uh, Christianism and uh, Buddhism. And for the side of my father, or practice is uh, Jewish from uh, East Europe. So uh, it was a very, very interesting contrast in my house because I was doing uh, uh, three different New Year. Uh, the normal New Year, like everybody, is a Jewish New Year and the Vietnamese and Chinese New Year. So to uh, to grow in different culture, for me, it was very open-minded because I always to the people, how do you know what do you believe belong to you? Because for me, it's like to be adopted by um, my uh, father, uh, make I adopt um, like um, unconsciously and because uh, uh, life bring me there, uh, the Jewish culture, you know. So how do you know what uh, you believe belong to you? It's uh, For me, it's a very interesting question because any religion or culture bring is uh, in the weight of it. So... Sometimes it can be positive, sometimes it can be negative, and uh, for me, it's uh, I take uh, the best of it because um, I love the questioning of uh, the Jewish culture to have uh, questioning the things, you know. I love the uh, the kindness of the Buddhism, you know, and uh, I like uh, the message of Jesus. Jesus it was, uh, I'm sure, for me and my vision, he was a cool guy, you know. It's like um, when uh, I hear Christ- Christian people sometimes talking, it's not the vision I have of Jesus. I think uh, it will be uh, somebody so loving, so caring for everybody, and 
you will be a, a great listener and a, a great person who forgive to everybody. And uh, so all this culture, it's part of my background and uh, I, I do my best for to take what is really useful for me because it's not nothing is right, nothing is wrong, but what is useful for me. And uh, I know what is useful in the way I impact myself in my daily life, in the life of others. Growing up with those diverse backgrounds in France, was there any conflicts within you growing up? For sure, for sure. You know, I, um, I, I, things maybe are uh, going to, uh, people are going, going to be shocked about that, but I was happy not to be Jewish because uh, when I was uh, 12, I asked to, uh, my father why I'm not was going to do my bar mitzvah. In normally, you are Jewish for your mom, but even though I was going to the synagogue with my father, and uh, but uh, I just knew when I was 12, uh, my stepfather, I, at this time, I thought he was my father because I grew up only with him. So for me to take off this way, to not to be Jewish and not to be a Christian or not to be Buddhist, for me, it was a great release because it's like um, it's like school for me. Uh, I never be comfortable uh, under authority. I like to question everything because for me, it's like it's about usefulness. It's not about dogma. And, uh, and we will talk about that more and more. How my teaching, it's always be your own guru. It's to empower people because I think uh, if we are alive, it's thanks for our ego. Everybody say we have to destroy the ego. I think yes and no. I think our ego make us, we survive. Our ego make we want to step one day more. Our ego make we have pain and suffering. It's uh, for this experience, some people want to die, but some people will won't. Or don't want to die. So for me, it's like, um, it's about questioning things. And, uh, I'm happy, um, not to have any levels. Even though I have some, I'm happy not to be none of them because I don't want to be part of the community. I think, and uh, I, I know it's like some people don't like to hear that, but wall make us small, a wall divide us. And, uh, if you travel all around the world, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants somebody to care for them. They want to care for somebody. But I think the tool or the teaching we use for to get there is not the right uh, way to do. And now I think uh, like um, one of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh say the next Buddha is not going to be one person. Uh, I think the next Buddha is going to be a community, a group of people who want to make a huge difference on the planet. And it's not about a leader anymore. I think it's about a movement, a community, a people or they engage the heart and they understand it's like your suffering is my suffering. And uh, one of my favorite, favorite quote, it's uh, from Hanuman. It's Hinduism. Hanuman say, when I don't know who am I, I serve you. And when I know who I am, I am you. And for me, nothing really making a difference between a homeless or Trump. We are all human beings. We are all thriving. And we are all this question. I think we are all the baby of somebody. And we are all figuring out. Nobody has this shit together. And we are all scared of something. And when we're going to put this standard, it's stop to evaluate our life with things, but just through experiences and openness to to be more guided by kindness, and love, I think that we're going to create a different realm. Uh, that's very true. Let me ask you something about the next Buddha. Uh, it's I, a question came to my mind when you said that uh, from Thich Nhat Han. Do you think the next Buddha might be digital? It could be. It, it could be because the thing is like, for me, people, they are, oh, you know, you're addicted to social media, you are this or that. Everybody always did that generation after generation we thought we think our generation was better like this new one and for me it's i think if it's the world is a, in a kind of a deep shit it's for the things we did before so the new generation is going to make the change because the old one still holding in the things and they don't want to let go because what what happened of fear and or scarcity it's our identity if we let die that, our ego thinks we're going to die. If we don't want to die. 
but it's the most ordinary experience we're going to have to live. Rich, poor, white, black, yellow, everybody's going to die. This will stop one day. And the only meaning of life is what we're going to do until then. So could be the next Buddha is going to be digital? For sure. It's going to be a movement? For sure. Because I think people, they're tired to watch for one person thinking they're going to save their ass when only it's like, God, have only your hand for to do the work. God, have only your heart for loving yourself and loving others. So God, the universe, tell. But people, they bought or ask for somebody for to do something. They have the only power to do it by their own hands to take responsibility of their life. I, I think, uh, you know, I don't think it's like, Jesus died for taking our sin. So we are already free. I am always already free. So the thing to see us like a sinner, to see in us like something, all these good things, it's something external, and all the bad things, it's something internal. Because if you, if you listen to people, I want to be happier. I want to be richer. I want abundance. I want to be more beautiful. All these beautiful things, they are always outside. But if you hear people say, I am depressed. I am sick. I am a bad person. All the negative things, they say, I am. And all the good things, it's always something external they want to reach. Yeah, I think now it's time to change this. Because the, at the beginning, what the word say in the Bible, and the way we speak, it's how it conditioned our life. And people still talking negatively to them, Self with I and the things they want, it's something always external. And I think it's like this have to switch. I am beautiful. I am a miracle come true because you and me, the possibility we came in this world, it's one to four hundred trillion. In me, our own existence, it's a miracle come true. And we're still doubting about ourselves, we're still doubting about our life, and we, we don't take the call. We don't want to show up for ourselves. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting observation. I've never heard anyone put it that way that all the bad is I, all the good is always external. That's an incredible observation <laughs> on your part. That's awesome. Let's get back to, to, to your, to your story a little bit. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? So when I was a kid, so I was fan of Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was my fan. So I grew up in a 18 district in Paris. If you know the 18, 18 district, uh, one eight in Paris, it's, uh, mostly Arabian and black people. So in, uh, uh, my, uh, what do you say, uh, high school for you, college for us, uh, we was only two Asian people on 600 people. So all the rest was uh, mostly half, uh, white people, Arabian and black people. So, um, and uh, it, it was very interesting because people was playing soccer or basketball, and uh, I choose martial art. Martial art was uh, my stuff uh, because uh, I don't do well in team. Uh, I was a little, I was a little bit chubby. So for me, it's like martial art, uh, you know, it's like I was bullied so to be Asian. I was bullied because I was chubby. So martial art was my way to express myself and Bruce Lee and uh, Rocky, Sylvester Stallone. Because um, uh, I think it's a beautiful loser. It's like um, it's uh, anti-hero, and I, I always uh, uh, want to be uh, this guy or nobody uh, put money on. But he believed so much in himself, he make a difference. And when I was at school, so I not was good studying, and but I'm not was a bad uh, guy. I was in the back of uh, the the room, close to uh, the radiator. And watching from the window because I never understood, even though I was so young, why I had to stand up when they say to me, why to learn, I have to learn things. I didn't have no interest to learn. Uh, if you, uh, dig a little bit and the uh, book stories, a lot of time it's not the right story that you touch earth. So, uh, if you see the map of the world, uh, Africa is one of the biggest continent. If you see the map, they make it, it's like, it's not the biggest continent. So all these things is like, I think for me, education, school, it's a way to brainwash uh, our young generation for to be more productive, but not for to be a, a real happy human being and not for to know who you are really, 
but just to condition the mind for to um, act with the sound of the bell when to stand up when you can have a break no to break so basically we are a brainwash for to work in a companies or manufacturing or something like that so in my childhood I was a silent rebel a silent rebel yes that's a good that's a good one I like that I might, I might steal that silent rebel <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I've, as I've gotten older, again, I, I'm very fortunate that I had the education I had, but quite honestly, a lot of the stuff they taught us, at least in the schools I went to here in the United States, it was a lot of BS. I, I wasn't taught about what actually happened to the Native Americans. I wasn't taught about stuff like Frederick Douglass and all this other. I wasn't ta- taught any of that. So a lot of it was BS. It was like the, the Hollywood version of history. So what was your what was your attraction? I mean, Bruce Lee's been a hero to millions. What was your attraction to Bruce Lee? So um, for me, Bruce Lee, it's like um, I, I, it's martial art. You know, it's like uh, the expression, and uh, if you see some movie, it's like uh, protecting people oppressed, uh, seeking the truth, and um, not talking too much. Yeah, I talk a lot. I think it was uh, this icon for me. And this way to move and yeah. So yeah, because he was Asian and uh, he was uh, one of the heroes I can identify uh, uh, physically to uh, anybody else, you know, because and this time it's like you want to know uh, Asian, they're not, is still not super represented in movies or except in martial art movie or but uh, Hong Kong or China, they have a lot of movie and a lot of great movie. But they're still not very represented. But it's okay, you know. And um, yeah, I, I don't think oh, it's bad or good because I don't care community. But in this time, he was a hero. I can identify physically myself. Did you ha- experience a lot of racism since you were one of two Asian kids in France, or was the culture different? I think we have this. Uh, um, even though it's like Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan or everything, but normally Asian people they are more like silent more tacit and more hiding they you know they don't want to make not to me too much loud they don't want so it's like i, I was pretty uh, bullied when i was a little and uh so martial art was a way to uh to gain my self-confidence back and um because you asked me my intense uh when i was kid it's like um um my father when he was 23 had a cancer, a thyroid cancer, and the doctor gave him six months to leave. And after that, uh, his attitude changed a lot because uh, they gave him six months. Uh, he, he, he became a very, very um, um, negative person. And uh, so he started to uh, beating me at home because I was good at school. During a, a session of ayahuasca, and um, I had a this vision, I was inside his body and I saw his life and because he thought he was going to die. He started beating me because he was scared how I'm going to take care of myself and take care of my mom. And I was going to say to me, uh, Chris, never be uh, between you and him. It was always between him and him and him and God. Yeah, it's not your fault. So um, for me, it's like I, I always have this intense or he was pretty rough. I think it's, I experiment a lot of, in the spectrum of life, I experiment a lot of pain when I was a kid, because my mom uh, made a different, a uh, few times uh, she intended to kill herself because she not was happy with her life. So I decided the person who loved me the most going to abandon me. Nobody will love me enough to stay with me. Uh, my father was beating me. He was the man who had to protect me and to show me how to be a man. Uh, my real father, my real, real father, biological father, um, you know this term people say spiritual gangster? Yeah, for me, I, I, I don't like it. I say it's like, uh, guys, uh, you live in Scottsdale and uh, you ride a, a Range Rover, you say you're a spiritual gangster. Uh, I know gangster, I know gangster. A real gangster lie, real gangster kill, real gangster uh, is not people you want to hang up with. So for me, it's like my, my real father was robbing bank and, uh, and, uh, he gets shot 
when I was two years old. He, he didn't die, but it's why my mom split from him. He said, it's not how I want to educate my son. So it's like, um, and I, I met my real father in, in, uh, He's not just somebody I want to spend much time with him. I humanly, I wish the best for him, like any human being, because I know he's dealing with his own darkness. But a real gangster is not people. It's like um, you want to hang out. So, and um, after that, I, and you know, it's I, when I share my story so fast is because uh, that was then. This is now. Uh, my past doesn't define my future. It's just something, or I can take a lesson from him. But when I was 12 years old, I, I get abused by a man in, in, a, in a swimming pool when I was cool. Uh, not big stuff, but enough for not making me trust in people. So um, he get arrested and he, he disappear, leave the country and everything. So I know what I say. It's like, oh, wow. But it, it's like a lot of people right here, right now, live so much suffering, like in Syria, kids or whatever. And or we see these people like so famous. Like, uh, uh, Anthony Gordon who just killed himself or all these things. It's like for me now, my past doesn't define my future. My choice of today, what I create today, going to create my reality of tomorrow. That's so true. That's so true. Is your mother still struggle with depression? Is she still alive? My mother, uh, I, I think it's a very sensitive human being. And, um, and I, when I share to that, uh, I just want to say, I love my parents. I, I, and, uh, that wasn't, this is now. I don't judge them. This is our karma. I cannot take them their weight, uh, on my shoulder. It's, uh, but, uh, th- this is the things they have to deal with their own, uh, darkness and own work. Uh, y- yes and no. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, she did because, uh, she had a very hard year this year. But in the same time, it's like, uh, she's, a uh, the most kind and loving person I ever met. And I know now everybody do their best. You know, we are all the baby of somebody. Nobody have our shit together. We are all figuring out and we are all scared of something. And I think, or uh, as a parent, I don't know, Richard, if you have kids, but for me now, as a father, I, I say to my daughter, you know, uh, her name is Jade, Jade Hope. I say, Jade, daddy is not born with a manual how to be dad. I'm figuring out with you. So I'm making a lot of mistakes and I love you and I wish you forgive me up front for all the mistakes I'm doing because I don't know. And as an adult, I'm creating myself still. Yeah, I want you to understand that. Daddy didn't have all the answer and I'm scared of stuff too. And for me to give that to a future generation, it would be a great gift to understand, oh, wow, Maybe it's time to sit here for chill the fuck out, you know? And don't pretend we have all shit together because it's a fucking lie. How did you end up here in the United States? What brought you to the U.S.? I know you spent some time in Spain. Yeah, so short story. Uh, I was uh, working in a photography and filmmaker when I was in Europe. And uh, I moved to Spain because I was a photographer over there. It came back in Paris. And in Paris, uh, I was working with uh, one of my best friends and uh and, uh, it was a rough time. And, uh, so I, I had, I took some money and make, uh, a travel, uh, East Coast to West Coast because, uh, I always, uh, love travel. It's one of my passion. Since I'm 20, I always took all my money. People have a house and car. I don't have much because all my money go and travel and education for myself. So, uh, I was always traveling for three months or more. And, uh, so I took a trip for East coast to West coast and U S for three months. And, uh, I went to meet uh, my agent in New York. And this time when I was doing photography, I went to, uh, this winter festival in Miami or in February of all these DJ in Miami, uh, uh, playing music. And I moved to a uh, Phoenix or my uncle of a uh, pastry uh, shop. And then there I uh, met my ex-wife, who she's the mother of my daughter. She's an amazing being. Uh, everybody love her, and I still loving her. And uh, she's um, more like amazing being. Uh, I think she's the best mom I could ever imagine. So, uh, and so I came because love uh, brought me here, and uh, I stay because uh, my daughter is here, and because uh, I love my life here. I, I love the community. I created and I love what I'm doing here. here. Well, what challenges did you experience? How did you learn English? 
Oh, I, I, so my English was very basic when I came here. Uh, I was speaking Spanglish because my, 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 uh, Spanish is much better like my English. And, uh, my, basically my English was for, uh, photography, like chin up, chin down. Uh, I, I, I knew all the anatomy and how to talk to uh, models or for, uh, photography and basic English. But, um, basically it's like, uh, reading and, uh, watching TV and, uh, Engaging with the people because one thing I have it's uh, this uh, resiliency. Uh, when I was in Spain, it was the same. I not was speaking Spanish, but uh, my survival instinct to eat, to connect with people, make uh, I'm a uh, very very um, fast learner. I stopped school when I was 15 and a half, and I never went to a college or university, and so I learned languages traveling. And I did all my education, uh, learning physically with master all around the world. You're Asian. You were, lived in France. You lived in Spain, and you lived here. How would you describe United States to someone that's never heard of the United States? Okay, so this is the only question. Or I was thinking about that because I know it's very controversial what I'm going to say. But it's very interesting. I still figuring out because it's a country of freedom or you can ride with a helmet, but you cannot collect in water from the sky or you get taxes for uh, taking sun, but uh, lobbies pay a, a lot of people for to put their product. So it's, it's very, it seems it's like I, I didn't figure it out, you know, it's like um, when in history, people from your, for me, I didn't understood until I'm here about uh, some people who say black, uh, uh, black life matters. Because for me, it was something very obvious. And, and where I grew up, I grew up with Arabian and black people all my life. So it not was something questioning, but to come here to understand this history, like 60 years ago, uh, black people couldn't be in the front of the bus. It's not like we talk about like a thousand years ago or, um, you know, this land and uh, you want to know, maybe people, they don't go uh, like that, but it's a Native American land. I'm working now with Navajo, Portuguese and meditate with horses. And we don't talk about so much about Native American, you know, people put war because they don't want Mexican people come here, but you still... 200 years ago, this land was a land of Native American. So, and um, I, it's not because I say that was then, this is now. Uh, for me, it's, um, I don't understand everything in the U.S. I'm very surprised, you know, it's like, um, uh, everybody's fighting for to have a gun because this is their second, uh, amendment or whatever, you're right, or the fourth, or I don't remember, but the thing is like, the kids, they are scared to go at school because they can get shot. It, it seems like sometimes it, I think people, they want to be more right, like to be happy. And people love to debate, they are argue. But uh, if this is a country or they love arguing, if they love to debate. And uh, if they love to be right. But um, I, I wish people now, they want more to be happy. And uh, to understand is like we're not so much different. And uh, because here people give so much in charity. They give like, oh, phone my charity this, my charity that. But they don't want everybody have social security, a free health care. Uh, they are okay for to go and war on this, war on that. Or we can see a gun, a, a have people kill and TV, but we cannot see a nipple. So I, I still figuring out, it's like I'm surprised. That I love to be here. I don't know if it makes sense, everything I share with you. What, what you're saying to me, at least what I hear, is, is that we're a country of conflicting ideas. <laughs> yes, because it's all about freedom. You know, it's like I hear all the things, but I think it's like people are not so free. Right. If you, if you think you're free... Uh, don't pay your taxes. See what happens. If you think you're free, uh, take the license plate off the back of your car. See what happens. 
and, and at the same time, it's like I say, it's like you can ride your motorcycle with that helmet. Yeah, we are in a free country, but you cannot drive your car without your belt. Right. <laughs> It's a country. It's a. I think you described it perfectly. A country of conflicting ideas and beliefs. And, and, and people, yes, and people they they have argument. Their yeah, arguments are always arguable. You know, it's like I hear that. Yeah, this is a free country, but people go in jail because they recollect rainwater. Right. <laughs> Which seems. It's like a common sense would say, but well, that is just insane. But yet it happens. It's happened, but I love to be here because I'm doing things I. And people I have in everything. So um, for me, it's like it's where I put my attention, where I put my energy. And for me, it's like because I'm a, I have a green card, I cannot vote, but I vote where I put my money. You know, it's uh, the way I live my life. Yeah, I wish everybody do that. No kidding, right? Well, let's get back to your story a little bit. So you, you came to America. You were doing photography and film. How did you begin your transition? from that to where you are today? Photography and filmmaking was my passion, but uh, so much, so much heartbreaking. It was so much competition. And, and uh, I have a lot of joy. I, I was doing campaign for Nikes and, and uh, soccer team and, uh, and so many things in, in, in Spain, you know. Uh, I was starting to do a, uh, music video clip in France and uh, doing advertising and everything. It, it was great, but a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. The competition was uh, uh, taking a lot of joy of the work. And my passion always was martial art. And uh, when I was uh, uh, 18, 17, I was uh, doing Tai Chi, Chi Kong, yoga, all these things. Eh? And I was interested in uh, NLP and uh, transactional analysis in Aagram, in everything. It's like when I was in my 20s. And it was very, very um, rare. I, not, I didn't have a lot of conversation about these things because now people are more aware about that now. I'm 40, uh, almost 44. So um, when I came here, I knew I didn't want to come back in this industry. I knew I didn't want to come back. I knew my passion was martial art. My English not was so good for to uh, teach workshop to connect with the people. So I worked for three years. Uh, I started as a dishwasher here. So to do a photography for Nike and uh, making film for a dog or whatever in France, they have an agent in New York, in Madrid, uh, to come here as a dishwasher. So it was very humbling. And after that, I worked for three years as a bouncer in a bar in Tempe. And then how did you begin this, this transition into who you are today? What were the steps you took? You remember we say, Chris, how you in, uh, you was uh, visioning yourself when, when you was a kid. I o- always know my life will be different. But how? I never knew. I knew a different reality was out there. But I never knew. You know, and for me, it was it's always I make this analogy. Everybody loves superheroes. Everybody want to be a superhero, you know? But nobody is allowed to put his underwear over his pants. Do, do you see the, the visual? Nobody put his underwear over his pants, but everybody wants to be a superhero. So it means for me, it's like we want to think, but nobody is really taking the risk or too brave enough for to take this leap, you know? And when I came here, I said, what matter for me? And for me, when we think about superpower, if you ask me, what is the superpower you want? I don't want to be invisible. I don't want to fly. I just want to be fucking present. I, I just want to understand it's like I'm here and now. I, I, to understand it's like I, I don't take for granted each email and excel. I impact my life. I impact the life of others. I have a real legacy. The connection I create. This is the superpower I'm working on. It's like one breath at the time, one day at the time, one step at the time, one person at the time. I'm not going, I'm not going to bring nothing with me. My grandmother died a year ago. My aunt died like six or seven months ago. And they left so many things. And after that, nobody took nothing. I have just a, a medal for my um, grandmother or so why I bring so much shit in my life? 
and nobody won't after I was going to die. They have not focused on more and what I have inside because home is always inside. So all the things I'm working on, it's to declutter my life, not to be a new me, but to be the real me. And my teaching and my coaching and everything, it's about that. Who am I? How I choose to show myself to the world? What are you tolerating now in your life? What do you want? And what else? It be that. Because you remember we was talking that at the beginning. Everything negative, you say I, but everything you want or how you said, it's something external. So say what you want. And what else? What is the motivation of what? Because it's always underneath. People say they want a car, they want a house. But at the end, if you scratch, you say, what else? What else? I just want to be loved. I just want somebody who loves me. I can be myself. If you scratch, it's always something underneath. It's what I'm, I'm working on. What else? And to be that, and to embody that. Because people say, I have an intention. But I say, no, be your intention. It's not something external. Home is always inside. So all my teeth, all my learning, uh, learning with Wim Hof. I was the first guy in 2014, uh, be certified by Wim Hof in all the U.S. Nobody knew about him. Now I'm working with Dan Grelay. He's a coach of Tony Robbins and breathing. And I, I know Dan uh, is going to make a huge leap soon because he's maybe one of the best master in breathing in all the world. If people don't know about that, yeah, I wish people knew about that. Now I'm working with Jay and a, a Navajo medicine man to learn how to breathe and meditate with horses. And I'm digging in that because I cannot bullshit in horses. I cannot use NLP, hypnosis, nothing. When I'm with my, the horses, I can just be present. If they feel me, they feel my frequencies, they feel my heartbeats, they feel my breathing. So I can just be present with them. So all the things I'm learning and all the things I'm creating now is to collapse time for people because I travel all around the world. When I was 24, I was in Nepal and Tibet. I was in Tibet, Lhasa. I was teaching Kung Fu to the monk. I was learning to meditate in, in, in uh, uh, Buddhism. I was in uh, Kathmandu uh, doing Vipassana and learning Reiki. I was 24. It was 20 years ago. So all this decade I spent, now my Dharma is to teach to the people all these things and to make them happier and healthier because my second favorite quote is from Albert Camus, it's a French writer. Yeah, Albert Camus say, don't let me walk in front of you, I may not lead. Don't let me walk behind you, I may not follow. Walk by my side and be my friend. And for me, at the moment, I can't teach if people they become better as I am. I did my dharma. I did my dharma. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu. May all people happier and healthier. And may my own thought and action contribute and the happiness and health of the world. And just that, this is my superpower I'm working on. I love that you say breathing and being present is a superpower. That, that is very much so because, what for one, we take breathing for granted unless we have trouble breathing. And two, we're almost never present. <laughs> Most of us are somewhere else almost all the time. How did you meet your, your business partner, Jared, and, and start Bajaya? And can you elaborate a little more on the, the Navajo and the breathing with horses? That's, that's fascinating. Oh, yeah, for sure. So Jared is is amazing guy. He's an amazing guy. Uh, he's an amazing nutritionist, unbelievable mover. And uh, so I met him, and uh, I was doc- making a documentary for Ido Portal in Berlin. It was five years ago. So I met Jared in Berlin, and we have this uh, interest in nutrition movement, ayahuasca. And because I was introduced, uh, I was very interested uh, to ayahuasca before I met Jared, but Jared introduced me to ayahuasca and medicine plant. And uh, after that, we become a BFF. And uh, it's like my brother, it, I went to uh, to uh, met uh, Wim Hof. Yeah, I said, Jared, you have to go to meet Wim Hof. It's nothing to do with the cold. All the things by product, go, it's beyond that. 
he went to see a, um, a whim. And after that, we create Vijaya, who mean uh, be victorious in Sanskrit. This is the name of a company. Our method we teach it's ethos flow, the habit of the flow. That uh, the company is Vijaya, be victorious. And uh, now it's like a uh, Jared is uh, doing his own things with movement and uh, nutrition because uh, he, he is so good. It's unbelievable he, how he heal people. And I'm taking more the part of breathing and meditation in the company. Well, I went to one of your workshops and it was by hands down one of the best ones I've ever attended. <laughs> I appreciate that. So you guys got something going right there. Elaborate a little more on the breathing with, with the, the horses and the Navajo approach. That's fascinating to me. It's very interesting because I met Jay uh, a year ago uh, for a, docu- a French documentary. Of, the name is Ozo. And uh, so uh, I met Jay and uh, he was on my bucket list. But as a life, t- sometimes take us very, very uh, busy. Yeah, I don't like to be busy. I like to be productive, but I had a lot of in my plate. So and uh, uh, so a month ago, I say, hey, I- I'm going to connect uh, with Jay. Yeah, I called Jay. He say, hey, yes, Chris, how are you doing? So for sure, come. And um, so Navajo um, never use whip or um, or walk in circle the horses. They sing to the horses as they breathe with them until they connect with them and they can ride them. So they never use violence. They never use pressure. They don't uh, intend to tire them and to break their uh, mind. They just sing to them, breathe with them, and take the time to create this connection until this link gets created and you can ride. So I start to uh, uh, ride bar back, uh, bar, uh, bar uh, back uh, horses, uh, uh, Indian style. And now it's like, um, I want to just to learn how to more in tune with horses. It's, um, it's very funny because you say how. And for me, it's like every culture, it's easy. You say, hey, step one. So do that, do this. I'm going to teach you your method. But Navajo, it's organic. It's super organic. So first day, you're going to breathe and connect and check stuff and see how you tune with them is day two, I I clean basically a ton of horse shit for all afternoon and just to be with them and breathing and create space and brushing them and uh, see how they connect with me and how they hug me because they was hugging, putting their head on on my shoulder like like I hug somebody and uh, breathing with them and if you're not in tune, you feel it because they're going to have a reaction. Oh, I'm not present. So is that in learning how to sing in Navajo? And it's super complicated because my memory is more um, visual in case kinesthetic. So Jay is singing to me in Navajo. And I'm learning how to sing in Navajo. So, and uh, because a lot of things is based on song for riding horse, uh, connecting with horses and, uh, and uh, all the culture. So how do you learn to breathe with the horse? What do you, what do you do? You, uh, you go on the side and uh, so you imagine the horse is facing you and you go on his, um, uh, left side. And uh, so you, you have his head close to your head and uh, you touch him and you, you hear his breathing. And so you start to breathe with the horse and to connect and to touch the horse. And you touch the, the arrow of the horse, and you start to sing. It's not just breathing, it's singing. It's a song really nourishes them, it calms them. And it, it, they are like, it's almost like a, a lulavi. But you want to know singing, it's for to have a song, you have to breathe. You have to breathe a song for it with that stop, stopping. And it's how the connection is created. After that, it's like a, when you, you start to be in a kind of trance of singing and breathing. You, I don't know. It's natural. It become natural and uh, you have emotion. And uh, I was tearing. I was tearing because my emotion was appearing in a TP and Scopa, two female. One is a mother. One is a daughter. They was putting their head, the weight of the weight of the head on my shoulder. You hear them breathing. You breathe with them 
and you song and Navajo and the connection and you move and they move with you, they want to stick with you. And uh, so it's like uh, you, you can be only present. That's fascinating. So with all your world travels that you've gone through and all the numerous people and cultures you've encountered and, and the cultures you were raised with, what would you say is one common thread? I think you alluded to this earlier, but we'll go back to that if you did. What's one common thread that you see throughout humanity, throughout the world? I think that the biggest problem, it's like um, I said at the beginning, when we want something, we reach to the sky, we, we watch the sky, you ask to God, give me this or that. And as I said, God have only my hands for to do the work. And God have only my heart for loving myself and loving others. If you take the time, the blood of everybody is the same. When we're going to lose somebody, we're all going to feel the same grief. We all love in the same way. We work all cry in the same way. And the problem is like, you know, religion, politics. And it's not for, and uh, it's why Freemason never talk about political and religion. Because I think it's create a lot of, a lot of separation. How you know what you believe belong to you. If we scratch underneath, people were always the same things. To be happy, take care of their family, and to create connection. But our education put us so much limiting beliefs, so much resistance. How, how we can think we're not good enough when we're on this earth? Where in the moment of my daughter, she's going to think she doesn't matter? When is going to come this? When it came in, came in your life? When it came in my life? When my mom tried to kill herself a few times, thinks no woman will love me enough to stay with me. When my father beat my ass and or whatever. I wonder man if we stop believing that. If we see all the beautiful things, something external, all these negative things, it's what I'm embodied. Yeah, I think it's like for me, it's always the same story, but the story is just a story. So I wish we talk about that. This next Buddha is going to be digital. And this is my goal. My goal is to create a huge movement, a huge movement of people aware to make a different life or they engage to say my religion is kindness, not in the like hippie BS uh, things, but really like I let you leave. What matter for you? How I can serve you is support you the best. Now, if I were to beat you and say I knew nothing about your background, I knew nothing about you, how would you describe to me what you do and who are you? Who am I? Every morning I ask you my question, this question. I am a miracle come true, so you are. What I do? I'm a master key who unlock your full potential. And people say, that I don't like the word potential. The etymology of potential, it's power. I unlock the power of the people for to be not the new them, but the real them. I mean, the human software upgrade. We all have a software and we all need upgrade. So it's what I teach, upgrading your life. I unlock your potential for to be the real you, not the new you. I love that. You know, the, the idea of human software upgrade is interesting because although evolution is very slow, our, our thinking can change very quickly and how we think determines a great deal. Yes, yes. I, 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 I love that. I love this analogy because I say we're in a um, scrolling generation, you know, Everything is scrolling now very fast, very fast. But nature is still nature. We cannot scroll nature. You cannot jump like spring to summer. You have fall between, you know, it's like, or, or, or it's like you have all this season. 
So the thing is like um, nature is still nature and we have to keep, we don't have to. I think if we resist to that or we, like we do, we think we can override that, it's a big mistake. But in the same time, things they go very, very fast. And I like to, uh, to pause the time because uh, it's very important for me to digest. Because we're a cloud generation now, you know, it's like we have access to so many information. And for me, I love that. It's to flip the pyramid because to have the knowledge we have and a century before, we have to make part of the uh, elite to be a very, very uh, well uh, born. But now anybody can have access to any information and knowledge. So you can be an engineer now without to go in university. You just have need a phone and computer. So if you want a piece of paper, it's great, but you don't need to. So this is a great, it's a very amazing, amazing um, uh, opportunity for us to upgrade in our life. How are we going to be allowed, able to, to let go and let go? You know, it's like I'm the creator in, in the same time. I don't seek external approval and I don't need a piece of paper to know who I am. I don't need your eyes for to, to know my own existence, but I need you for to grow, to ha- help you, serve you to grow too. Chris, I want to thank you for being on the podcast and, and, and enlightening us with some of your wisdom and your experiences. And uh, your story is a great story. And uh, I, I foresee great things for you. I see nothing but the best. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I, I, I deeply appreciate that. And uh, be the person you want to meet in the real life. Just that. Be the person you want to meet in the real life. It's going to change all the connection in your life. Thank you again for listening, and please leave any comments or suggestions. We're always looking for ways to improve our show and make it the best show it can possibly be. Visit mindfulaccord.com, where you can find additional episodes and you can follow our blog. We give some helpful information on mindfulness, meditation, and just ways to manage our everyday stressful lives. And most importantly, If you know of a friend or a family member that would benefit from this story, please share it with them. Until next time, I'm Rich Decker.